You know, as I sift through the endless river of sludge that passes for modern entertainment, I'll occasionally come across an unexpected gem glistening in the murky depths. Like Dune, for example, which proved to be a thoughtful, slow-paced and philosophical adaptation of some pretty challenging source material. But one thing that leapt out at me while I was watching it was, holy shit, isn't it nice when characters act like smart, mature adults who make sensible decisions, control their emotions and actually take the time to consider their situation instead of ridiculous hyperactive teenagers driven by hormones and emotions that have somehow inherited the bodies of grown adults. It seems like some kind of crazy luxury from a bygone era now, but it brought me to a pretty interesting conclusion about why modern movies suck harder than Tatiana after two lines of cocaine. They're written by children for children. Or rather, people with the intelligence, attention span and emotional maturity of children. And this fundamental limitation filters through into everything they produce, which is fine if your idea of entertainment is eating Play-Doh and farting in the bathtub, but for anyone looking for something just a bit smarter and more subtle, it's a bit like going to a burlesque show, except the dancers all look like Elizabeth Warren and they want to spend the evening talking to you about federal tax reform. Anyway, allow me to illuminate you. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to lift some examples from Star Trek over the years. It's a franchise that's been around longer than most of us have been alive, so it's probably a good reflection of how right and character development have changed over the years. First up, let's take a look at The Wrath of Khan from 1982, which is generally regarded as the best Star Trek movie ever made. The basic story is that an aging Admiral Kirk is given command of the Enterprise again when an old enemy hijacks a Federation starship and uses it to get his hands on a doomsday weapon that can destroy entire planets. All along the way, he also intends to dish out a bit of good old fashioned payback on Kirk as revenge for leaving him stranded on a barren planet decades earlier. There's a lot going on here in terms of character development, but the central story arc for Kirk is his struggle with getting older. The movie opens up on his 50th birthday, and it's clear he's not exactly thrilled about that fact. He's very much a middle-aged man now, stuck in an unrewarding desk job and facing up to the realisation that his best days may be behind him. McCoy even gives him a pair of reading glasses as a birthday gift because he's too proud to admit that his eyesight isn't what it used to be. Overall, it's a pretty universal concept that most people can relate to and empathise with. I mean, how many of us are trapped in some boring office job we don't enjoy, wishing we could live a life of adventure and endless possibilities? How many of us are getting older and realising we can't do the things we used to do and that other, younger people are slowly coming up to replace us? Deep down, we all know it's going to happen sooner or later, even if we'd rather not think about it. Now consider a similar scene that Star Trek Beyond from 2016 rips off. I mean, pays tribute to. It's the same basic setup of Kirk and his friend McCoy celebrating his birthday over a quiet drink, and a subdued Kirk reflecting unhappily on where he's at in life. The difference here though is that this version of Kirk is 36 years old, and he's in command of a starship out exploring the galaxy. He's literally in the prime of his life, doing the things he enjoys most. He should be loving every single minute of it, but because the movie wants to set him up as a reluctant hero who's thinking about moving on to new things, the best it can come up with is to project the middle age angst of Wrath of Khan onto a character who's at a completely different stage in life. It doesn't ring true in the slightest because it's trying to force a situation that can't happen organically. Now consider the ending for Wrath of Khan. With his ship crippled and most of his crew dead, Khan triggers a doomsday device in a last ditch attempt to take his enemy down with him. The desperate situation forces Spock to sacrifice himself to repair the Enterprise's warp core, allowing them to escape the blast at the cost of his own life. Kirk's forced to watch his best friend die in front of his eyes, unable to help him, and it's interesting to watch his reaction as the realisation sinks in. He doesn't scream or cry out or lose control, he just kind of slumps to the ground, devastated and shocked as the camera slowly pans away. And when it's time to lay his friend to rest, he delivers the eulogy with stiff but stoic composure, only wavering once at the very ends. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most human. Why? Because he's a grown-ass man and he's the captain of a starship. He's expected to lead by example and hold himself together, whatever his personal feelings, because that's how professional officers conduct themselves. And that little moment when his composure slips becomes all the more poignant because you know how hard he's trying to hide it. Now let's consider how this same scene plays out in Star Trek Into Darkness. <laughs> Yeah, 
I think you begin to see the difference here. Not only does Kirk's death happen in the midst of a ridiculous action scene, with starships crashing into cities, buildings getting flattened, and people dying by the tens of thousands, thus giving the audience no time to process it before it's swiftly undone with a bit of cheap deus ex trifica. But it's also very clear that the characters in whatever passes for modern Star Trek very much wear their hearts on their sleeves, running around like frantic lunatics in emergencies, openly discussing personal relationships in front of superior officers, and responding with big emotional outbursts in high stress situations. It's quite a contrast from the more mature and restrained characterizations from the earlier movies. As another example, let's consider how characters handle interpersonal conflict. Like in this scene from Star Trek The Undiscovered Country, where it's revealed that due to a major industrial disaster, the Klingon Empire is on the verge of collapse, and is now making peace overtures towards the Federation. Naturally, this causes quite the difference of opinion about how to handle the situation, with the more hardline officers seeing this as a chance to eliminate their most dangerous enemies once and for all. The more forward-thinking elements, on the other hand, want to negotiate an honourable peace rather than push their opponents into a corner and risk a destructive military conflict. Both perspectives have merit, and the script is smart enough to let them have their say, before revealing that Kirk has been personally chosen by Spock to lead the diplomatic initiative. Naturally, he's not happy about being railroaded into a mission like this, partly because of his professional mistrust of the Klingons, partly because he's an aging commander who fears the rapidly changing world around him, but also because he has a very personal reason to hate them. David? David is dead. All of these elements combine together to create a strong and very understandable emotional reaction. You can see how fucking angry he is with his friend, the way he stands at the opposite end of the table, keeping a safe distance between them. At first it starts with cold accusations, but when Spock tries to argue his case rationally, the real emotions start to come through. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. Until at last it all becomes too much and Kirk finally shows his true colours. They are dying. Let them die. It's a smart, well-written scene that demonstrates the changing dynamics between the two friends, and actually paints Kirk in a pretty unflattering light without completely destroying him as a character. He's an old, bigoted, reactionary officer from a different era, afraid of change, still licking old wounds, and unable to see past his own prejudices. And yet, you absolutely understand why he feels this way. Just like the debate during the briefing earlier, neither side is portrayed as strictly right or wrong, they're just different perspectives, born from different experiences, and both are definitely worth listening to. But what's most important to note here is how the two men actually conduct themselves. They're controlled, rational and measured, arguing their points effectively and not simply shouting over each other. Yeah, Kirk's definitely got an emotional stake in this, which quickly comes through as Spock presses him, but even then he manages to keep himself mostly under control. Why? Because that's how grown fucking men deal with things. Real men don't fly off the handle at the slightest provocation, or start fighting and yelling at each other when they disagree, because losing control like that isn't a sign of strength, it's a sign of deep weakness and insecurity. Weakness of character, weakness of self-control, and weakness of self-discipline. Now let's consider how Kirk and Spock resolve their differences in the new version of Star Trek. <laughs> The last example I want to give you is how the chain of command operates in different eras of Star Trek. In the episode Gambit from Star Trek The Next Generation, the captain and first officer of the Enterprise are both out of action, leaving Data to take command of the ship and Worf to act as his first officer. It's a change of role for both men, and unfortunately Worf doesn't take too well to this, openly questioning his decisions in front of the bridge crew. Finally. This prompts Data to summon him to his ready room for a good old fashioned ass kicking. Like my previous examples, the great thing about this scene is how restrained and understated these two characters are. They don't yell at each other or come to blows because they don't need to. Data calmly but firmly explains that Worf was wrong to question him in front of the crew. You continually question my orders in front of the crew. I do not believe this is appropriate behavior. Worf offers the justification for his behavior. Is it not my duty to offer you alternatives? And Data lets him know that shit isn't gonna fly with him. But once I have made a decision, it is your job to carry it out, regardless of how you may personally feel. And guess what? Worf recognises that he was in the wrong, apologises for it, and the two men go back to work with no hard feelings. If you will overlook this incident, 
I would like to continue to consider you my friend. I would like that as well. Holy shit, imagine two people dealing with interpersonal conflict like calm adult professionals. Whoever wrote the dialogue for this scene deserves a fucking medal. It's an absolute masterclass in the subtle enforcement of command and authority, mixed in with the conflict between two friends having to adjust to a sudden change of roles. Without even having to raise his voice or resort to personal attacks, Data is able to perfectly explain the mutually supportive relationship between a captain and his first officer, and make it clear that he expects that same level of support from Worf. Disrespect will not be tolerated. And as a contrast to that, consider how the chain of command operates on a show like Star Trek Discovery. Now you get off my ass so we can get back to work? The shit would hit the fan. Well done, number one. Well, it's freaking amazing. Excuse me? Freaking amazing. Evolution's a fickle bitch, am I right? I'm going, I'm going, get off my ass! Sir! Get off my ass, sir! I love how these people are able to just say and do whatever the fuck they want with zero repercussions, casually backchatting their commanding officers, and generally acting like immature morons. Seriously, the level of discipline and professionalism here is about the same as a fucking liberal arts college. They're like teenagers that have suddenly been put in command of a starship with no training or preparation. They're impulsive, hyperactive, emotionally unstable, unprofessional, and generally pretty incompetent. They're the absolute last people on earth you'd trust your life to, and unfortunately they've become kind of the norm in modern film and TV. So why the fuck does this keep happening? What happened to all the adults in the room? Well, from my point of view, there's three different strands to this answer. The first is a simple one. Money. Most effects heavy movies are expensive as fuck to make now, and if your film doesn't rake in a shit zillion dollars, then you might as well start learning to code. You need to appeal to as wide an audience as possible, particularly the younger demographic, which means lots of action, lots of energy, lots of jokes, quippy dialogue, and fast paced storylines that don't demand too much brain power. No time to waste people, go go go! The second strand is this weird trend towards infantilizing modern audiences, carefully shielding them from anything that could be considered difficult, scary or threatening. Whether it's public information videos, commercials or government announcements, everything's presented in this weird, childish, happy clappy format that looks like the sort of inoffensive crap you'd show to kindergartners. Take this US Army recruitment video for example. Jesus, take a second to think about the kind of person this video is going to appeal to, then imagine how well that person would do in a fucking war. The final and probably biggest strand is the people hired to actually write this stuff. I've said before that a character is only ever as smart, capable and resourceful as the person writing them, and well, you don't need me to tell you that Hollywood creatives these days aren't exactly paragons of tough, stoic, confident self-reliance. They're the kind of people who consider mean tweets to be on par with mass murder. In fact, most of them have lived the kind of safe, comfortable, sheltered lives that previous generations could only dream of, never experiencing anything even resembling hardship, adversity or danger. The kind of stuff that actually builds character, self-confidence, life experience, and generally makes you a more interesting, capable person. The end result of all this is a generation of writers that are weak, fragile, spoiled, narcissistic, emotional and insecure, completely unable to handle adversity, conflict, masculinity, or anything that challenges their own self-image. In short, they're basically children inhabiting adult bodies, and as a result, they lack the experience and maturity needed to write smart, confident, capable adult characters. And well, look at the results. It's bad enough for people like me, who still remember what quality writing looks like, and now have the dubious pleasure of watching previously smart, mature characters get bastardized, infantilized and destroyed. But what's even more disheartening is the effect this is having on people who don't have that solid foundation to fall back on. The ridiculous infantile shite that today's writers produce is helping to shape and influence a whole new generation of young moviegoers, changing their perception of what supposedly heroic characters should be and do. And if that's the case, I can't fucking wait to see what happens when they get out into the world. Anyway. That's all I've got for today. Go away now.